16. Come on, there we go. And we're broadcasting. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Stories Out of Time and Space, the sci fi movie review podcast and YouTube channel now. So you can see our wonderful, wonderful, beautiful faces uh, if you so choose. If you don't, just listen to the podcast on any of those podcast catches. Uh, I'm Scott Weatherly, one of your usual co hosts, and I'm joined by my usual great co host, Julian Darius. Julian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Rocket Group reporting for duty. How are you doing, Scott? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm, I'm sort of launching from five million years into the path from the past <laughs> to control the human race. Yes, uh, we are. We've moved a bit more into the future. Last uh, last episode, we did 1954's Godzilla. We're moving into the 60s now, and we're actually this is uh, maybe not the last. I don't know. We have to see, but this is the first time we're going to be doing a Hammer film. Now, not a Hammer horror film. Um, but a hammer sort of sci-fi film. We are going to be in Quatermass and the Pit from 1967. Uh, they starred, and I've got my notes here to check. So Andrew Keir as Professor Bernard Quatermass, James Donald as Dr. Rooney, Barbara Shelley as Barbara Judd, and Julian Glover as Colonel Breen. Um, so, Julian, what, first off, I don't think you'd ever heard of, of Quatermass, had you? Or had you? I don't know. No. No, if I did, it was like in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen notations or something. Mm. Um, you know. Uh, Quatermass Quite does appear in, I think, Century. Um, yes, I saw that. He's like oh, mm. just referred to as like Professor Bernard or something. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, so apparently he was a big influence on Doctor Who and he was mm. one of the, you know, so let me ask you some questions about Quatermass, which, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, for Americans, Quatermass that's not an English anglicization. It's not quarter mass, which is what my brain always wants to say. Quater mass. Quater mass. Um, yeah. The name was apparently picked out of a phone book. Um, so he was one of the first British um, sort of original uh, heroes to television. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, the, there was. Um... It's a BBC series. So there were three, there were three, well, there was eventually there were four, but there were three original series. Um, the Quatermass Experiment, uh, Quatermass Experiment, uh, Quatermass 2, the original title, and then Quatermass and the Pit. Um, and I think there were something like 1952, 54, and 58, or something like that. Um, and yeah, so he was very much sort of, you know, it was, um, a professor, a physics professor. Um, and then Hammer sort of picked up the the, the mantle, uh, took those series and sort of contract, cons you know, made them sort of more concise uh, and, and turned them into film. So, in, in fact, the first Hammer film to be made under the Hammer banner was uh, the Quatermass Experiment, uh, I believe so. So, yes, um, the, you can see them, the, sort of the Quatermass Experiment, Quatermass 2, and then obviously Quatermass and the Pit, all from Hammer. Um so yeah, I, I, you know he's a bit of a lost. If I'm honest, like you say, he's a lost British sci-fi uh, hero because you you know you could ask pretty much anybody today, and I, I doubt they would have heard of him unless they've got some real deep cut knowledge. Um, but like you say, he really influenced Doctor Who, which I think you can see quite a lot from this film, especially the early Doctor Who. You know where mm. the Doctor, like the sonic screwdriver, is less important, and he's a curmudgeonly old professor. You know, yes. I love that that first Doctor. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the cool things uh, you said, like, you know, he's a professor. Um, I also think of like X-Files, right? Like basically this was like the sci-fi X-Files, mm. but starring, you know, sort of like a, a, a older middle-aged uh, British professor before the X-Files came up with that, you know? Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, what I like most about this, and we'll get into it, is the fact it's very, it's very British in the sense that like, you know, it's, it's, it's science driven, because you know, there, there's no easy access to weapons or guns or anything like that. So you know, the police don't have any. The, you see the army in this, and even they're not armed. Particularly, I think there's one or two, maybe two scenes where you see them. That may be a budgetary thing where Hammer's like, "Look, we've got three rifles. You have to take it in turns to use them. <laughs> pass, pass them around the scenes." Um, but uh, um, other than that, like I say, they, they didn't have that to, to, to use. And I also think, you know, these were written, obviously, in a, in a very early post-war Britain. Um, and so, you know, the military are almost sort of, um, not so much stripped out, but pulled back. You know, that 50s Britain, it's very much the, the military are pulled back and the sort of the public uh, uh, um, 
consciousness is really pushed forward it's this thing about endeavoring to do better as a sort of private institution like the rocket group mm -hmm. um you know the british rocket group uh, which is obviously the british equivalent of nasa um is yeah is, is is what the focus is so it's 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 interesting that that's sort of where the, the mindset was well and there's that whole conflict in the film between the uh military and the rocket group and one of the things you find out relatively early is that sort of the rocket group is going to be militarized and you know mm. uh and I, I think one of the most fascinating things for me and you know i'm sure we'll we'll hit on other points about sort of uniquely British things is I, and I really dig this, the way in which the military are just stupid assholes. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is not a Michael Bay movie. There's no American movie where the military is ever, they could be incompetent, but they're always, you know, righteous, good dudes at heart at worst, mm. right? This is a, a British film and the military are just there to be in the way of Quater Mass, who is right. He is right all the time. <laughs> and the authorities and the government are just dumb and bumbling it and endangering the world. Don't trust well, the military. No, well, I was really interested because, I mean, Colonel Breen, well, I'll actually give it the plot in a second, but Colonel Breen in this is a dick throughout. <laughs> like, he is, he, like you say, he is just in the way. He's always wrong. He he, he can, you know, he's closed-minded. And I thought, maybe that's like a hammer thing. You know, maybe it's, because it's the 60s. This was a, a released in 67. Maybe they've changed it a little bit, you know, made him more of a uh, this type of character for the 67 version. So I went back and I actually got, I've got the original 58 um, series, the BBC series. They released it on Blu-ray and stuff. It's really good. It's uh, there's, a, there's more to it. There's much more story. But no, he's just as bad in that. Like they really do. Uh, the the only difference, even the police in the fifty eight version, they have this sort of like um, in the in the, um, this in the film, they have a single police officer who takes him into the ruins of the, these houses just over the road from mm -hmm. the, the, the tube station, which I'll explain in a minute. And he tells them this, this story of the sort of the the, the what happened in the twenties, this sort of um, scare, which is why these houses are abandoned. In the in the TV series, you have almost like a, a comedy duo of coppers that sort of like keep cropping up, and they're sort of like you know it's almost like um not so much Abbott and Costello, Abbott and Costello level, but they're there as like the bumbling police, and it's like oh oh mess this one up again. Better not tell Sarge. And you're sort of like, every everyone in authority in these is just yeah, as you say, it's just bumbling uh, or you know is underhand. Um, so yeah, I think that is not so much the times. It's Nigel Neal. Hmm. So the guy who obviously wrote this—that's clearly his. <laughs> that's clearly his <laughs> mindset. Well, it definitely stands out, and it's definitely unique. Mm. Yeah, uh, like I said, because it figures the same with Doctor Who. Who's very mm -hmm. anti-touristic, anti-anti-weapon sort of. You know, so th that clearly comes from this same uh, master, uh, mindset. Um, yeah, no, it's probably worth giving a bit of a plot because it's a specific plot that sort of le levels, to, you know, to, to, especially to the finale. Um, so the story goes that uh, Hobbs End Tube Station is being extended. Uh, and in doing so, the builders uncover several uh, ancient fossilised humanid remains. Uh, this gets passed to a Dr. Rooney, sort of an archaeologist of some sort, uh, and in digging further, they find more remains, the possible of six to seven humanoid figures and what is believed to be a German bomb that has fallen down. So the military are called in as the bomb squad to try and defuse this bomb. Upon digging in further, they find out firstly that the device is not metallic. Um, it's larger than expected. And part of the digging, they actually uncover this humanoid skull from within the device. When asked, Dr. Rooney exclaims that this is not possible because the skulls are over five million years old. Uh, when the ship is finally uncovered, it's much, much uh, uh, larger than expected. And the debate begins about whether or not this is an alien craft from five million years ago or a German World War II propaganda weapon. Uh, the answer to this is pretty much soundly given in the finale of the film <laughs> when um, aliens are found in the ship. And the ship itself has a level of sentience and starts to send out a message which controls people in the local area uh, and drives them to attack and kill people that are different to themselves. 
um, which we'll probably get into more because I really love the ending of this film. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the plot, really. It, it, you know, there's nice little nudges, um, but uh, this, uh, you know, as you said, this film's very much about science over superstition. Um, yeah, but any, any no. thoughts to sort of to kick us off? I don't, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, sort of. I mean, I will say that I, I find the idea that it is a German propaganda device persists way longer than it should, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, those Germans, they, they put insectoid, uh, you know, um, alien uh, mock-ups into the, a, a V2 rocket that clearly looks like, you know, a small alien <laughs> ship, right? And, you know, then they disintegrate, and that was all to cause chaos and confusion, and they just surrounded it with five five million year old uh, humanoid yeah. heads. I, I mean, it, it really is a bit preposterous. Um, but yeah. as far as, I mean, one of the things that I do, I do think uh, this this is set apart by is a sort of like unity of sci fi and the supernatural. That mm -hmm. in in a kind of like you know Cthulhu way, right? Like there are these. It, it's key to the plot that. This these insects who piloted this ship uh, were Martians, and mm. then Mars is now uninhabitable. And, and this is a little <laughs> convoluted, right? They realizing that they're going to go extinct and that they could not live in Earth's atmosphere. They the phrase is like they colonized us by proxy, so mm. they would you know harvest humans and take them back to Mars and alter their intelligence. And then get also uh, the timeline of human evolution massively screwed up here. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, they take them to Mars, give them intelligence, give them telekinetic powers, and then put them back on Earth to colonize by proxy, right? You know, and I think, mm. okay, well, those insects still, you know, wipe themselves out. And, you know, so there's a vision of like the insects. I mean, it's, it's quite a remarkable for its time. Um, you know, vision of the, the Martian insects, you know, rampaging and destroying mm -hmm. themselves. And the idea is that, like, they have this ritual and they don't like outsiders, like typical insects. And so there's a, like, all humans have telekinetic powers. They have these sort of, like, ancestral memories. That explains demons with horns, because that's what the insects mm -hmm. kind of look like. And all of magic and witchcraft and all of this stuff throughout the millennia was really this lingering, unused telekinetic potential that the aliens done put in us. Mm. So at the end, I mean, it's really like a supernatural film, right? I mean, there's a projection of like Ghostbusters, you know, in the sky, you know. And oh, yeah, yeah, it, it definitely has. Like, and that's a, a good sort of an, uh, comparison is that Ghostbusters idea because it is it's that sort of science versus superstition i mean um I, I will i will say as a side piece even at this point like if you get a chance to watch the tv series um it's just as good if not actually slightly better because it's three hours long it's six episodes six 35 minute episodes and they do expand on all this story stuff i mean there's there's slightly more silliness uh in some of the technology like um that that's uh you know, but it's it's of its time, but it's good. And this this story of the aliens, the Martians, and stuff is actually sort of rolled out over three episodes, so you get it over an hour and a half of of, of entertainment rather than in a twenty minute block as sort of within the film. And so it's a bit more, to, it's it's a bit easier to digest in the show. Um, but it is you mentioned sort of Cthulhu there, and it is incredibly Lovecraftian. This notion that actually the human species, the human race, was seeded on this planet. And evolution was kickstarted by an alien race, like we, you know, you know, whether it's sort of the old, one, ancient ones with the Shogoths or Martians, like you know, we are actually a, a cosmic engineering rather than true evolution. This stuff, and I, I, I love that idea um, because it, it does sort of, you know, when they're talking to the minister uh, at one point, and he basically says, like, "Well, that's it's almost like that's an affront to everything I believe." So I'm going to believe this German propaganda idea because it's I can swallow that, um, and this is where I think Andrew Kerr as as uh, Quatermass really uh, is you know, why he's so good because he sort of literally like rolls his eyes. He, he, he would agree with you <laughs> and I. He's like, why why are you still even having this debate? <laughs> why is this a thing? Um, but yeah, I, I I love that element of it. But it's slightly it's slightly convoluted, but. Um, 
I don't know. I, I just love the idea that, like, say that there's this thing, um, and when they do go back through the history, they, you know, they do the history of Hobbs End through the the like you say through the thousands of years, and there's always this notion of like these little creatures or the demons or something else or some sort of it has a bad feeling to it, um, and it's always traced back to this ship that's clearly just been underground. It's always when it's disturbed as well, which is very sort of you know supernatural, um, but it always has a root in this sci-fi idea of, of a. A, almost like a failed alien invasion, or no, successful alien invasion, really, when you think about it. Yeah, and I, I will say this. I mean, you know, I, I like that it's this kind of, like, weird blend of supernatural and sci-fi. Um, mm. I think there are times that, that this is a legitimately creepy movie, um, mm. you know, especially for its time. Um, the And, you know, the altering of human evolution, while, you know, certainly not a new idea, is done better here than in a lot of films, um, including, say, Prometheus, where it's mm. like, that. I don't know how that would even fit. Okay, so the timeline is screwed up here, but it's not like, oh, you know, uh, Earth developed chimpanzees and apes, which were like, what, 98% the same as? And then mm. aliens just came here and deposited humans, you know, like, <laughs> hey, you know, why not? I mean, that it's so asinine it, it you know it's unbelievable here at least the idea is that sort of you know i think the idea although the timeline screwed up is that the sort of transition to homo sapiens um you know from sort of neanderthals was you know somewhere around that time which you know you're four million you know 4.9 million years yeah. too early but okay uh was spurred by the <laughs> alien tech yeah, I kind of like. The, there's even a bit where they actually acknowledge that because they're sort of given an early interview to the press, and Doctor Rooney is sort of saying, "Oh yeah, we we estimate about five million years." And one of the sort of reporters says, "Well, that's a lot. That's a lot further back than originally estimated." And, the, and Professor Rooney sort of goes, "Uh, yeah," <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of like that's what you're getting. We're not going to talk about it any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, the other thing is that that whole like I like the. Um... I think the whole like the ghost haunting thing, they go into these houses. I, I found it unbelievable that there's a, uh, you know, tube or a metro station surrounded by abandoned houses. Yeah. And they sort of think like, oh, this is these houses must have been abandoned since the Blitz. And in fact, they were abandoned since the 20s. You know, I can't be you know, believe they're still abandoned right next to a metro station. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's kind of like investigating that. And then there is in Westminster Abbey, uh, which I know was reused in the, in the first Quarter Mass, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, you know, discovering the records of sort of, you know, uh, Roman times and, you know, and all of and the Middle Ages and rumors about Roman times. And it reminded me of, um, you know, I'm a big Transformers fan. My mm -hmm. one of my favorite Transformers stories is the Man of Iron, which is from the Transformers UK comic. And mm -hmm. there, there's a ship where you know they find the records of like here's how this weird robot that would emerge every hundred years, you know, would be interpreted by these different cultures. And you know, you see castles, and you kind of walk through British history, and it, it strikes me as something, you know, uh, tinged with Britishness that I like a lot about that. Yeah, it is. I think because we've got such a long history, um, you know, we, we do sometimes like to roll that out a little bit and sort of say, like, oh, yeah, we, you know, it touches off. I mean, even, you know, I know that like, um, Neil Gaiman does it a lot with Sandman. Like, you know, he sort of, we would go back and drip that sort of thing with his, history meets folklore and superstition and stuff. Um, and like I say, the way that the, the alien image is re reinterpreted over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. I really like that, and I will say actually, again in the TV show, this this the section with the um, the abandoned houses is actually again dealt with better. There's an entire episode on it, and instead of it just sort of going to an abandoned bunch of houses, what it is is um, they've been trying to evict these houses that they're increasingly abandoned um, over time, and a lot of it is due to the Blitz. They acknowledge the Blitz and stuff in it, and there's this old couple, and they're like the last ones to leave, and then they're going to be knocked down for development. Um, that's all part and parcel of it. And Quatermass ends up following these two people, these old couple, and talks to them about it. And they sort of reel off these stories of everything that's happened in 1927 and how it's taken this long, but some people held on. And it's even alluded to in that section of the film that they saw things and they talk about possession. 
and you start to realize that it probably wasn't possession it was something activating this telekinesis and stuff so they're drip feeding this information throughout um which unfortunately obviously has to be compacted for the for the uh the film um but i like the fact that like i say it, it's you know they they have these justifications that like every time something's going to happen or something happens i mean you think about it maybe the blitz would have you know because at one point they do say oh no there was only several we recorded with incendiary devices being dropped just down the road and stuff so they've got the record so but i do like that, that it goes back and back further and to the different time zones well mm -hmm. and even the fact that the uh craft is first interpreted as an unexploded bomb um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's something that, you know, uh, through, on the continent of Europe, I mean, people are still killed uh, every year by, you know, ordinance left. I mean, obviously, that still happens in Vietnam. Um, but, you know, the, that's a very real thing, um, you know, and then there's this kind of just grounding in, um, you know, in British history in a way that wouldn't be possible over here. <laughs> you know, it'd be like, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, looks like somebody dropped this uh, fork on the street in the 1920s, you know. <laughs> well, the population of this city was 10,000 back then, so, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it, it definitely is, it feels British in that sense. I mean, there's a lot of things in this that are very British. I mean, there's sort of, um, you know, he's a quater mass himself, like, he's a law unto himself, I think that's the one thing. You know, him and Rooney, sort of, like, they'll talk to the press, um several times and at no but they're reprimanded but they literally <laughs> get nothing more than a slap on the wrist uh, and they are causing panic i mean at one point the ministers i, I totally agree with the minister at one point uh, the defense secretary where he's sort of like um you've told this to the press like they're going out with these stories of ghosts and aliens and all this other stuff like you're going to cause a major panic like we've got to reel this back he's like well they need to know the truth and i'm going to like <laughs> No, no, like I'm with the government on this one. Like, you need to drip, <laughs> let's drip feed this information out of, about the fact that we have now proven not only are there aliens, but we may well not have been, you know, evolved fully evolved from the from you know how we thought. Um, yeah, that was an amazing moment for me. I mean, you yeah. kind of found yourself thinking, "Oh, I kind of side with the government." I thought, like, how I I was sh utterly shocked. I mean, that might be the most <laughs> shocking moment in the movie. <laughs> Where, you know, they've got this brain scan device, which is, you know, mm. one of the plot weak points. But it's recorded this vision of uh, the insects alive on Mars. And, you know, there's just this scene where Rooney is just sort of showing photographs of, you know, insect <laughs> Martians to <laughs> Quater Math. And he says, well, what should we do? And he says, release them immediately. <laughs> and I'm just like, what is going on here? And you found it like, you know, whoa. I mean, and there is a sense of like, you know, maybe you, this should be reviewed by someone higher up. Yeah, but, yeah. but the flip side is like, it seems so idealistic in that very much sort of like, let's put some professors in charge of stuff, you know, mm. <laughs> that I thought was wonderful. It's kind of Star Trek utopia. It is. And uh, there's, there's several moments when you sort of, in, in the other films as well, and there's that similar thing of sort of like, um, you know, I mean, the first film is legitimately about the fact that Quatermass sends a rocket into space and doesn't really ask for permission. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's just who he is. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of that going on of him just sort of like, because again, it's almost, he gets involved tangentially. That's the thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. which is very much the way these, a lot of these things, you know, with some of these sort of types of heroes do. It's very Doctor Who. Um, you know, because Doctor Rooney and his and, and Barbara Judd, the sort of his assistant, um, are there to uncover these the remains, and then they find the bomb. So it just so happens that Breen is a former bomb disposal. He led the bomb disposal unit during the post uh, uh, Second World War, and Quatermass is just like I'll happily pop along with you. Just so happens. Um, and then all of a sudden, literally takes over the investigation <laughs> and sort of is then running around London uh, and parts of Britain um you know to taking on this sort of like major in, inter intergalactic conspiracy um why not yeah uh, why not I, I i did think that the sort of like the rollout of the martian information you know you said you know it's sustained much better i do think it still comes in phases um mm. i think that especially for a modern audience uh it is a talky film it is yeah. you know i did find that it was it, that it dragged 
in places and I think like, okay, get back to the ship. <laughs> you know, like we've had a 10 minute conversation about this, like, okay, but it's not horrible. And I do mm. think that the central ideas of it, um, I mean, I, I was going to say another sort of way in which it's rooted, rooted in, in British history, you know, this idea of uh, digging an extension to the underground and finding something amazing. That happens all the time over there, you know? You yeah. find remains of kings in parking lots, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, and that's an amazing thing. I think the blend of the supernatural is amazing. Um, and uh, some of the... We'll talk about the climax in a while, but... Um, I, I mean, I think it is a sort of, it steals the show. Uh, mm. I, I can't imagine, you know, walking away from this and not saying, you've got to go see this movie for those last 20 minutes. Um, yeah. But also yeah. the performances, I mean, I think are, are, are pretty good, especially when they're allowed to be a little less British and sort of be possessed, you know, <laughs> especially mm. in these reserved uh, prim and proper uh, characters uh, get possessed and just kind yeah. of crazy and spooky <laughs> i do look the, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of scenes where you sort of you know the, there's obviously a couple of character actors or small time actors there's uh, the, my two favorite bits where it's what i like to call star trek acting where clearly the camera's moving and the set isn't sort of thing and they have to react mm -hmm. to that is um when they're trying to drill through the bulkheads they find that part of the ship is like a blank there's a blank material sort of screen with some symbols on it sort of circular symbols which quatermass is a, is a physicist but to, it's a pentagram and it goes back to thousands of years of magic i'm like that that's clearly not physics fair enough i'll let, <laughs> let that slide um but yeah when they're trying to drill and it's sort of like you know it's a it's a great looking bit of kit this big long arm with this big heavy drill on the end of it and they're just sort of like shaking to sort of like to prove how difficult <laughs> and there's all this sort of noise coming out of them and you can see that they're shaking the camera and it, like after a while i'm like oh bless them like this <laughs> <laughs> i can imagine all these sort of like middle-aged men being act as actors being told like, right you've got to react to this like there's a, a screeching noise coming at you and it's really hard so how would that feel? And they're just sort of like, eh, ooh, and it's sort of like, okay, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit awkward at times, but um, and and also in that in that scene, I kept thinking, um, how you know he's got to make sure that drill does not touch, and you start thinking too much about how it's staged, right? Like that guy holding that drill, just going, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> he's got to make sure the actual drill bit <coughs> does not touch the wall. Because yeah, that wall is a flimsy set, right? Yes. So it's got to be close enough to look like it's sliding along this non-metal yeah. wall, but not actually touch it. Yeah, because clearly they keep saying throughout it that the bulkhead and everything is harder than diamond. And all I'm thinking is, I don't think plywood's harder than diamond. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, that is true. Um, and the other one that I I, I like um, and I find hilarious is uh, one of the young soldiers is clearing out uh, the pump from inside the ship because he's got some water and they've been spraying down the inside. And you just hear him howl. And he, he's, he claims that he sees one of the um, the young or the, the small ape type creatures, like the ghost of it or the image of it or whatever in the ship. And just the faces he makes, and he just keeps saying, it's horrible, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's that sort of almost Dick Van Dyke level sort of uh, Cockney accent. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I quite like Barbara, um, mm. you know, who is his assistant. Um, uh, I think that's right. And mm. uh, her, when she becomes sort of possessed uh, near the end, her reaction is not to um, overdo it, but you know, to um, sorry, to uh, you know, sort of seem, uh, it's much more a sort of like uh, weird Rosemary's Baby scene or something, right? Where she's just like, she looks odd. She's not looking or reacting in the right places. She, you know, there are a few scenes where people are possessed and they're sort of walking funny in a way that is disturbing. Um, but I thought Barbara really did a good job. Yeah, but she looks focused. That's and It's that sort of thing. It's because she's walking towards them and, 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 and walking them down. Um, I think she's good throughout. I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, to be said, it's made in the 60s. Um, she, she seems, you know, she's, she has a little bit of agency and intelligence. So they've given us, they've given us some intelligence and 
she, I mean, she could be a bit of can, you know, just a bit of fluff where it was sort of, um, you know, she's the eye candy of the film, but she's not. Like she, she gets to, oh, she gets to do. Um, she basically gets to make decisions. She gets to sort of do the investigation. Like, you know, they give her some agency, which is quite interesting for 67. And Hammer, for that matter. Right. And, you know, I mean, I grew up sort of uh, watching Hammer films on VHS and going through, you know, local uh, video stores and, you know, tracking these down because they weren't available otherwise. I mean, the other thing is you talked about her agency. Um, you know, obviously, she's she's not making the main decisions. But she's never reduced to a love interest. Nobody expresses like, you know, oh, you're very pretty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah. no, yeah. nobody even says that. Let alone is there a love plot involving her? No, but they ask for her opinion. That and that's mm -hmm. the thing. There are several cases where, where Quater, Quatermass will say to her, you know, like what? But what about this? Or what do you think of this? Like, you know, she's there to be a part of the team. Like you say, not just a love interest, not just an eye candy. So, um. I, yeah, I do find that quite interesting, and apparently that's another thing of um, Nigel Neal, like you know that he had that was was, was part of the sort of the whole Quatermass thing, um, which again I seem I think is influ influence later on influences things like I said like Doctor Who. I'd even say sort of Star Trek, this thing of you know gender rights and stuff to a, to an extent. Um, right, she does remind me of the um, of the teacher in the 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 first batch of companions hmm. in in Do Doctor Who. Uh, who seems, you know, she's a attractive, relatively young, but obviously intelligent and competent and weighs in on things. Yeah. So, she, I mean, she, you know, she sticks throughout the film. And like I say, she's and also she's never shown to be like the scream queen or the sort of like, you know, requiring um, to help. Like, you know, like she walks, but, you know, after everything's happened, she still walks back into the tube tunnel to get, to, you know, to take, pick up some stuff and, there's never a sort of like I can't go down there. I'm terrified. Like no, she walks with confidence. <laughs> it's it's you know it's quite interesting to see her given that level of respect, really. Yeah, quite so. Um, uh, I I do think that the you know I always come back to you know the climax. I mean I I, hmm. I think that there's a kind of like. I mean it, it is sort of talky. There's a sort of slow rollout of this thing, and you know there are those moments where you think like okay. We're we have like, you know, this is the first time I've seen this, right? So I've got like 30 minutes left to go and I'm like, okay. Um, so yeah, we were talking, yes, we were talking about the finale. Uh, so technically she's there, but we're now talking about the finale. So you were saying with, we get to that sort of main, uh, the, the big sort of epic finale of it. So yeah, you keep bringing out. So what are your thoughts are on that? Uh, I think it's amazing. Um, I, I think that it's sort of a, the film as a whole is kind of a slow burn. And, mm. um, you know, initially, like, you know, very early, like, this is an alien ship, right? <laughs> it yeah. takes you about like, you know, a half an hour to kind of get there. And then you're like, okay, now we're introduced to the insects. And it's like, oh, that's cool. When are we going to see these guys? And then you're shown this um, hallucination that Barbara has of the insect mm. that's, um, we are shown it because she's connected to this brain scanning device. And so it's like, okay, the, I'm getting a little bit of a money shot here. You know, it's a short kind of grainy the tease. Sequence. The tease, right. yeah. And and so it's like, that's really exciting. But then, you know, as you said, like, you know, we have the, you know, drilling sequence and, you know, there's a, a people who say that they have seen stuff and you're like, well, why didn't, you know, show don't tell, man. Like, I mm. want to see that insect alien. Um, and so there's, you know, by the end, you know, I mean, in fact, I'm watching it for the first time thinking, um, well, clearly there's 30 minutes left. We're not getting to Mars, right? <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like, <laughs> there's a limit to how much is going to happen here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, really what happens is, um, you know, the, the, uh, general or Colonel Breen, uh, believing this German insane theory um, mm -hmm. has taken control and he has invited reporters and people down into the underground and to show them this craft. And essentially, uh, Quatermass has sort of predicted that um, some sort of effect is going to happen. And he seems to be aware that we have things buried in our brains 
from this alien modification um, that could trigger this insect-like calling ritual that was shown in the video. And if that is triggered on people with telekinetic powers, this is going to be quite ugly. And, you know, we're treated to like one scene where sort of like boards and papers are flying around as the worker uh, sort of triggers it. And that's interesting. You know, he stumbles around and the papers blow around and, and that's good. But once you get to that final scene of just commotion and it's staggering to me, you know, um, it just keeps yeah. escalating and escalating and, you know, walls are collapsing and people are being trampled. And then we're in the streets and you're like, the whole buildings are on fire. Like, yeah. are, you know, there's like, you know, uh, burst water main and, you know, quasar masses like going through this like post-apocalyptic landscape with like, you know, swirling fires and whole buildings lit up and, and <laughs> boards flying everywhere and rubble flying everywhere. And, and you know, it's just amazing to see. I'm sure I can't imagine how audiences would have seen that at the time in theaters. Oh, yeah, seeing this for the first time. I mean, the good, like you say, you get the tease. This is the thing with this film. It keeps building and building. So you get this idea of this is what the aliens like, you know. And th th to be fair, the on stage, on set physical effects aren't, for the aliens at least, they look a bit hokey. They look like they're made of paper mache and, and some sort of chicken wire. So they're not great. But when you see that other planet and you see, you know, you get that tease and there's that thing of like, this is a you know, this is a ritual that they went through that they would kill things different from them to keep the thing pure and all this other stuff. It's like that's that little bit more of information. You think, oh, okay, and there's this insinuation of like that sits in our head somewhere. That's a, a danger to us now. Um, and then you get the guy with the drill, and that's the first time you do get those reactions where he's down there alone and he sees something, and all of a sudden, like you know. It's it looks a bit hokey because things are floating around and this other stuff. But then, like you say, the effects on him and it follows him into the street. Um, he runs out of the station and it's like you say, the tables are falling over and it's a bit sort of invisible man esque, isn't it? Sort of as he runs along, the table falls over and the boards are wobble and this other stuff. But then once he goes outside, he goes to like um uh what what we'd call like a takeaway truck. And all of a sudden, as he, as he runs up to it, just all the cut, like, all these like uh, cups and saucers and that just fly off it, and everyone's like, "What the hell?" And then you know he runs off again, and he's sort of um, been fo being followed by stuff. And it's when he falls to the ground, and the ground starts to undulate around him um, as he gets into the church. And you've got this tease of like, this is what happens when one person <laughs> loses control of this sort of like innate submerged in telekinetic powers. Um, and that's so when you do sort of go, that's what happens when one person happens. And then Breen's like, I'm sending all the press and everybody in. And you can like, Quatermass is going like, yes, it's not going to go well, this. It's really not going to go well. Um, and that's, I, I almost take it like, a, it's almost like a Carrie White scenario from, from Carrie. Like, this is, you know, this is not control, all this violence and all this uh, destruction it's not caused by control. It's caused by lack of control. Like, this is people like lashing out in this possessed state and just destroying stuff around them. It's incredible. Oh, I agree. I, and I agree completely. I mean, that undulating ground scene, I mean, it's not hard to figure out how it's done, right? But yeah. it does look really good. And I love yeah. what you're describing about, um, you know, what I call it is the sort of like a peeling of the onion plot uh, mm. technique where... The point is sort of like reveal everything one step at a time, let the build that suspense, let the audience, you know, get to it. Don't just, you know, throw people into this right away the way we do now. Um, and so you kind of get to see every sort of iteration along the way. Um, but I agree with you. I mean, there, I think that's, that's a strong scene where everything flies off of that, that truck there. Um, you know, the ground undulating looks creepy. Mm -hmm. Some of the possession stuff looks creepy. And, but boy, when it really erupts at the end, I, you know, I, I found myself thinking like, oh, wow, now like rubble's falling on them in the underground. And, you know, and it's like, oh, they've really escalated it. And boards are flying around two by fours and bricks. And, and you can say like, okay, that brick is, you know, probably made of foam, but <laughs> there's so much stuff flying around and the wind is blowing. They've got like wind machines or something. And they're just uh, shots where you think like, 
are they even shooting this level? Like, you know, this is not, mm. they're not shooting it like Inception where they're rotating what they're in. But you get that sense of like, wow, everything is moving. Everything is alive in the scene. And somehow it just keeps escalating. Somehow you get, I mean, I love that burst of water main and the, and the firestorms raging through the city. Um, I think, you know, before the end, it does a, a better job of depicting sort of urban destruction, albeit on a sort of smaller scale than uh, Man of Steel and some of these big CGI blockbusters. Mm. Yeah, and I love, I, I, I have a real sort of soft spot for miniatures, um, mm -hmm. like, you know, those sort of in, in screens or, or in set effects. And that's what you get, just repeat and repeat. It's sort of like, you know, at one point you see the, 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 the terrace houses collapsing because they've been sort of, taught, you know, uh, battered. It's all done with miniatures and stuff. It's just so well put together. But the one thing I find the most, you said sort of creepy, you know, the parts of this film are legitimately creepy, I think. But there's one bit in all of this uh, where they sort of, <clears throat> you've had all the destruction. It's sort of like this initial sort of wave of uncontrolled, um, psychic like, outbursts or telekinetic outbursts, which is cause destruction. They seem to have focused it, and all of a sudden they're in groups. Mm -hmm. And you see what this one guy, this one guy who clearly, because you find that the Doctor Rooney is uh, doesn't have it. So Quatermass does, and he, he keeps having to fight it, but Rooney doesn't have it. And then you see this one guy in the street who clearly doesn't have it either. And then he sort of runs down one street and there's a bunch there. He runs down a back alley and there's some people there. He goes to go, go up a flight of stairs and there's some people there. And he's crowded in and he's all, he's all battered and torn up. And all of a sudden, they stone him to death. Yeah. With that, I mean... power. And I was just like, oh, Christ, that's, that's what I've forgotten that was in there. Yeah, no, that, I thought that sequence was phenomenal. I mean, I it almost feels like disconnected from uh, the rest of the film, but but in a good way. I mean, I thought even just going back to that scene with Rooney and Quatermass uh, in one of those abandoned houses where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think for the first time Quatermass is able to sort of, you know, not just emote, but act possess. And he says, you know, um, he says like, you know, my God, I would have killed you. Uh, I could have killed you without trying. And that really drives it home man like here's the hero the stately yeah. professor just going like i wanted to kill you and i know i could have with a thought um mm. and then like you say you know they they sort of wander out and you see this kind of like odd these groups that just seem uh they're possessed and they're just sort of like moving in group and and uh it's very sort of twilight zone and that guy running and when you realize like my god he's being stoned but he's being stoned with giant blocks yeah. bigger than a man's head thrown yeah. at him through telekinesis. And you're just like, this is so amazing and creepy. Yeah. Like you say it goes from like naught to 60 like that, like in a second, it just, and I love that. I mean, one of the great things, there's another line that Quatermass says is because uh, he gets, he drives him into a pub. It's like an abandoned pub and he gives him the whiskey and he sat there and he says, he actually says, did you see them? And then he looks out the window and says, see what? And he says, my God, they're people. And you're like, well, wait a minute, what does he see? So, you know, it's, it's that realisation of like, actually, if he's possessed, he might be just seeing, he's not seeing, he might be seeing insect creatures out there instead of all that and all this other stuff. And it is, like, you just, there's little lines in this where you're like, what, do, what does that mean? I, I don't understand that. Um, and I, it's like they actually, at one point, the ship itself, um, Quatermass states, um, we, you know, they talk about it being just a ship, and he says it's clearly not a ship. It's got some sentience, or it's got some. It do, you know, we've seen it react to stimulus, and so it's not even, you know, the the end of the film is not the aliens. In truth, it's almost like a a, a default mechanism of the ship, and it's the ship that's projecting this, or that's triggering this psychic, uh, this thing. So even that's like, you know, just crazy, um. And to top it off, like that that bit, like you say, is Breen going back down um, to the thing? Like, oh, it's, that that bit, yeah, is is mad. Well, and Breen kneels in front of the ship, mm. and again, like he, I mean, he's possessed. What would you know? It, and and then you later cut back to him, and he's been like, you know, you know, it, it looks like uh, turned to salt or something, and sort of disintegrates. Um, and it's very creepy. And I think that at its best, 
you know, I love what you're saying about the the ship because this then becomes a kind of story of an alien artifact that we don't really understand having all of these weird effects that truly we don't totally understand. And, and you know, there's a theory postulated in the film, but like you say, there are all these lines where it's like, I'm not entirely sure how this works. And I don't know that they know how this works. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a kind of like ambiguity there. You know, we talked about Solaris and we talked about this idea that like encounters with alien life would be weird. They're not mm. just going to be like, uh, I say going to be, right? <laughs> Obviously, I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're not just going to be like, oh, you know, hello, welcome to Spacecraft 74. You know, <laughs> I see you like uh, purple governments. It's, it's going to be like, oh, their culture is foreign. Um, so here's this. I mean, I, you almost don't need the entire alteration of the human brain uh, mm. plot. I mean, I, I would probably like this movie more if they stripped that away and that craft itself just had this telekinetic effect. Um, but as you say, I mean, I think that, you know, there's it sort of descends into this orgy of violence and strangeness, and it's not totally clear why the colonel would kneel in front of the craft that's glowing and seems to have, like, veins, like, emphasizing that's organic. They mm. zoom in at one point, and you see, like, cells. It's the weirdest shot. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it doesn't, you know, like, it's not clear why Breen would do that, but that might make sense to this alien craft that's kind of manipulating mm. him. We don't totally have to understand it. No, and that's what I love about it, because he can take it different ways. Like, you know, because Breen has been fighting this the whole time, and then when it's obviously triggered, it's that case of, like, okay, well, you know, say, is he worshipping it? Is this sort of, like, subjugation? Is there something more to it? I don't, I don't know. Um, it could even be that he doesn't actually feel anything. And maybe, you know, he's actually, it, this is his own choice, because he sees all these other people reacting and he isn't so it's this i don't know it's left ambiguous and i really love that um but yeah this thing about the, one of these lines as well that we've talked about that i love um I, is great that in, in a lot of films today when there's this alien encounter you're a bit like well why here what you know why would this happen sort of thing why here even when you watch like close encounters of the third kind there's this thing of like well, why here sort of um why why in america or why in wherever but with this, they're like, oh no, they actually acknowledge like if they were going to do this thing of seeding and and you know uh, a species like this must have happened on a massive scale. Mm -hmm. like, this would have been global, um, and the, the like. So this was clearly a crash landing. This was a cock up. Like we are seeing one instance of however many times this happened, and we don't know where the other ships are around. And that leaves it with me to, 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 for two things. Like it clearly starts to expand. As it to the end, the finale, like it starts in the tube, and this this thing as it sort of uh, bursts out, and you get the sort of the image of the demon or the the, the alien um, projected. So its influence starts to spread, and that's what they're trying to control. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, this could go global. <laughs> Do you know? Because it could. Yeah. You know, how big is this? And where are, are the other ships that have crash landed sort of like five, six million years ago? You know, somewhere else on Earth. Like, could the, is this still a danger to us? Because they the, let's talk about how they resolve the situation yeah <laughs> well i mean there's good and bad there right i mean mm. you know you know roni just says the devil's enemy was iron and yeah. there's kind of like the uh idea that somehow this is going to like ground the energy there's a lot of talk about like well you know there, there's this giant projection of you know an insectoid like you know demon figure in the sky that's largely white and kind of staticky and and looks good for the time i mean um it's legit creepy I, but i'm thinking like why in this telekinetic event would you do that that kind of bothers me a little more than like you know colonel breen kneeling down but it's still a good effect i mean i'm willing to go with it it looks cool but breen just kind of says this and there are these several lines about like well that that being is made of energy. Everything's made of energy, you know? And and it's like iron will ground it. So, so Breen climbs a crane and his idea is like to swing the crane into this energy projection, right? Which again, to me, it's like, it's not clear at all that that energy projection is the source of the telekinetic stuff. Yeah. 
wouldn't yeah. that be the craft? Like, don't you want to drive a crane into the craft? But yeah, I mean, I, I do think, um, you know, the, the his, uh, conclusion of that as the crane just kind of comes loose and swings into this energy projection and then collapses in flames is incredibly awesome. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. the resolution. It costs a life of a major character. And I have to say, of, of everything in this movie, what I find the most quintessentially British is the masterful shot of Roni on the crane as he's swinging into pro the projection. And it's that kind of like nonchalant, stiff upper lip. Uh, yeah. This is the right thing to do to die for the people, yeah. you know, for the greater good. You know, it's not celebratory. It's not, I'm sad, I recognize I'm going to die. It's just... It's so quintessentially British to me. It, it's so funny to watch it because it, it is. It, it's, it's one of the shots that is, like you say, is very Hammer. It's very sort of British. If this was in any other film, I mean, if this was this kind of thing, to me, this is the same as um, uh, the nutty guy in the biplane in at the end of um, Independence Day. Mm. Uh, you know, climb and go. You know, and you for those sorts of characters, you've got a sort of like a like. You know, he says, "I'm back." There's a one line that you sort of like. You know, or if you, you know you're going to take down the villain, but it's going to sacrifice your life. It's a "fuck you" kind of line. With right. here, he is. He's literally sat on the top of this thing, and he could be sort of ducking a, a biscuit into a cup of tea, whilst he's like, <laughs> and just be like, "Well, dear, it was the best thing to do at the time." <laughs> and we won, but it's he is. It, but uh, it's not even like a flash; like it stays on his face, and it's almost like a resolute sort of nonchalance. It's like, ah, I knew this was going to happen. It's 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 the it's the only conclusion that we can reach. So, um, it is. It's very funny the fact how sort of quiet of a moment it is, really. Well, you say um, it's funny, but I mean, it it is. Um... You know, if I may say so, I mean, this is, you know, we buy this stuff, right? I mean, it's like mm -hmm. the rest of the world buys to one degree or another, at least pre-Trump, right? That America is this wonderful land of opportunity. And, you know, they used to think the streets were paved with gold. And it's like, yeah, you know, that's kind of true. But we got veterans under bridges, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, my vision of Britain was always that stiff upper lip. It was, you know, uh, Space Corps and Science First and, you know, mm. the sort of like guys in World War II saying, you know, oh, yeah, this is the point where we realize uh, we're all going to have to sacrifice ourselves. No sense crying about it. Onward. You know, you'll, yeah. and it's like, oh, we all know we'll never speak to our wives again who have been established previous in the movie. Nah, not going to say a word about it. No hesitation. No time to whine, boys do yeah. it you know yeah. we're, and it's quite lovely i think um mm. you know it is propagandistic i mean it is you know a stereotype but you know of course the american version as you say is like well it's like the end of uh dr strangelove right like yeah big guy yeah. Yeah. But like yeah. i'm gonna kill you <laughs> you're gonna die now demon <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, and that, I I like that so you say about the shot as well because it doesn't just rest on him. It literally flicks with him and the demons. He gets closer, and the demon sort of comes more into focus, and it just looms over him. So it, that that is really creepy, and I do love that. Um, but the, the the thing with this film is because that that's the resolution. Like they do, they successfully short out this energy. Uh, Roni is killed, and the um. Uh, the crane collapses and then that's it. Like, and you are seeing that the people are released from this influence because of Barbara. Barbara's obviously been influenced and she's been trying to attack and Quatermass has been holding her back. Um, and uh, you see that she's now returned to her normal state. So you assume that everybody else has. And so you just see them sort of sat there panting and sort of, you know, a bit dirty. And, and then it's, uh, the titles come up and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot it ends like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it ends so incredibly abruptly. I was like, no, no, no. We need at least a couple of minutes epilogue scene on this. I want, I want, what, what are you going to do with the ship? What are mm -hmm. you going to do about the destruction? What are you going to do about the knowledge that now we are, have been influenced by an alien vessel and we start to destroy ourselves? I want some resolution. Right. And as you say, like, how widespread was this? I mean, mm -hmm. are, are 100 people dead? I mean, whole buildings have partially collapsed. Uh, mm. You know, clearly there is a good death toll here beyond just the guy being stoned. Um, you know, you see rocks falling on people. Um, you know, are we talking about a thousand dead? Are we talking about ten thousand dead? 
how far did this radi radiate out beyond uh, Hobbs Lane in London? Mm -hmm. Or indeed, was this further? We just don't know because at that point, I mean, another thing we haven't mentioned is there's a bit of creepiness as they show TV broadcasts and the broadcast cuts out. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of uh, um, less regional narrator comes on and says, oh, well, we've lost signal. And then he cuts out. So we really yeah. don't know how far this goes. So I agree that that's abrupt. I have those same <laughs> questions, but I love this ending. Uh, I, I was shocked when the when the credits came up, but it's not just that uh, they're kind of panting. It's that like the crane falls in flames, right? Mm. Uh, Roni's dead, <laughs> you know. Um, Barbara's been released, and then, but Quatermass, Quatermass, then wanders a burning street, <laughs> you know, with yeah. debris everywhere, and there's a yeah. first water pipe, and it's just like wandering in post apocalyptic rubble. Yeah the end of the street thing she's been and then they both just kind of collapse against objects with desolation in the background yeah. and the credits roll and the song is sad and it just seems to me like okay this was the most pyrrhic victory yeah. you could possibly have right like we won but tons of people are dead. There's no illusion that it's like, rah, rah, mm. we beat back those aliens for America. You see? It's just like, yeah, no, we uh, we defeated this thing, but like yeah. we're in an apocalyptic wasteland. I, I so love how just uh, down we've note said this it before is. About sort of this, this British sensibility of just pure cynicism. <laughs> of, like you don't get a, a good victory. There's no such thing as a good victory. Because it's like, well, we defeated the aliens. And there's there's several things like, uh, and I, I think about this with Breen, like that thing of him giving himself up to the ship is basically it's an acknowledgement of like, yeah, this is my cock up. Like I caused this. Um, but like I said, at the end of it, like, they defeated the aliens. But again, there's this pure acknowledgement of whatever happened here. Like we, we are, we're going to struggle to move beyond, you know? And, and that's what I find so interesting that sort of, um, you know, I mean, this would be like, not want to make comparisons because it's fictional, but, this is almost like nine eleven compare like this the, that, that's the effect that this would have, wouldn't it? Like this would be this would scar a nation for decades. If you were like, yeah, part of London tore itself apart because of mm -hmm. you know what for whatever reason, like whether the truth got out or was suppressed or whatever. But you know, maybe they'll say like it was a, a gas leak that caused these hallucinations or whatever. But for, for like thousands of hundreds of people are dead, or thousands of people are dead, and we did it to ourselves. You know, like that doesn't go away. Um, I will say the TV show ends slightly differently. So it's a similar thing. It's a similar sort okay. of conclusion in that they, they ground it and all other stuff. But it does end with a, a an epilogue. And that is that epilogue is Quatermass on the news with a panel of other scientists. And basically he does actually say, um, yes, we now have to... Um, come to terms with the fact that we actually whilst we consider ourselves human we are of course partly martian uh and have all this other stuff and he has this little speech and then just wanders off and you're like although you're sort of you know you're now acknowledging that something's <laughs> going to be done with the ship and all this other stuff like you've still got on tv you've done it again quite mass you've gone on tv and you've basically said yeah we're all part alien night <laughs> and then just wanders off yeah Drop, mic dropped. See That's ya. What it's all about. Um, <laughs> he, he just has a habit of doing it, but uh, I, I, yeah, I do kind of. I like the end, but I'd love just a little bit of. Maybe that's my modern sensibilities. I just love that little. I'd love an epilogue. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. There's very little else to sort of criticize. It's criticize this film for because I just love it. I think it's so good. Um, and the other thing as well, it's in sort of glorious sixties Technicolor as well. I should say so. It looks great as well. You know, I think this film looks really good. Um, I've got, I don't know, how did you see it, by the way? Just out of curiosity. Okay, so you've answered, so uh, I've, I've got I a DVD it of it. So that, you know, uh, apparently the Blu-ray is um, has been, they've upped the quality and it looks phenomenal. So I, I will be at one point um, uh, mm. upgrading, I think, because I do love, I do really enjoy this film so much. Um, so yeah, well, well, me too. I mean, 
you know, about that ending, um, you know, I, I know what you're saying, the, the, uh, but the, I have the same sort of sensibilities. I mean, I, mm. you and I both love like movies of the thirties and the, and the forties and even the twenties that just kind of have those <laughs> ending, like, you know, monsters <laughs> dead, you know, not a more to see here people. Um, but you know, we love those movies, but I, I always think it's the denouement that is the most interesting, mm. you know, like start the movie there, you know, is what I feel half the time. I don't feel that this time. I mean, I have that thought, but you know, it occurs to me far more interesting to me that the, we are part Martian or, you know, you know, the takeaway isn't Martians re-engineered us again. Mm. I think this would be a better movie if you just get rid of all of that. You know, there's a takeaway at the end that it's like, like you said, we did this to ourselves. And here is a British professor who is, you know, reserved science. He represents, uh, you know, the this missile core. You know, this mm. is, you know, like the Ministry of Space. This is NASA. This is idealistic. It's anti-military values. And... The takeaway at the end of the movie is like, okay, yeah, bracket, we all have telekinetic powers, or most of us do, but also we have this like trigger in mm. our heads that makes us kill people and makes us violent. And um, I've seen it, you know, I mean, you see it in mobs, you see it with uh, the kind of logic of, um, you know, mob uh, mentality as people gather and Sometimes they'll break windows or whatever they do. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's something about the, at the same time that we are in this film, and it said like, we are 10 years away from bases on the moon and bases on, on Mars quite possibly, which I, I'd love to believe, right? But that's, forget the hoverboards. That's what, that's what I want. Um, and of course that didn't come to pass, but at the same time that we are reaching out into space and, and achieving these unprecedented things in human history that are changing the, our nature of the species and our place in the cosmos comes this incident that reminds us, yeah, we're kind mm -hmm. of um, pack animals that are capable of insane yeah, animal violence. Yeah, no, I agree. Violence. It's funny you say about this, that line again, because that line is a complete... That line is taken whole, wholly from the 1958 as well. So there was a, a... I've said about the cynicism. There's still an optimism. So even in 1958, they're like, we will have bases on the moon within 10 years. And I was like, well, that's that's ambitious. But you're right. I think I think that's the thing of, of this is... Um, one of the, the interesting points of this film is, is you know, like you say, it's science driven. You have a professor, he's a physicist, it's in, he is accompanied by an archaeologist, and it's all about discovery. That's what this thing is about. You know, it's unearthing the past, but it's about this discovery. Um, and these greater ideals, learning that we you know our, almost our place in the universe, which is fascinating for the times, but then also this reminder that, like you say, we are just animals and we have this inclination to be incredibly violent and incredibly incredibly sort of clan based and um whether it's alien driven or not we do not like things that are different to us and i think that's sort of you know it's coming out now you know more and more like as we you know as we record this it's sort of really prevalent this notion of, of clan based whether it be by race or clique or creed or whatever we are a clan-based race, species. We sort of find cult safety, and it's, it's always going to be there. And I just think this film does touch on that, you know, without sort of really trying to hammer it home. Mm. Yeah, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I, I often struggle with exactly this thing. Um, and, you know, essentially our brains evolved in tribal societies. And distrusting the tribe over the next ridge. Now you can trade with them. This, you know, this is to mutual advantage, non-zero sum advantage. But if you're not a little distrustful of that tribe over the ridge and the rumors of like, <laughs> I hear they're coming to get yeah. us, right? You don't survive, right? So I mean, we evolved in very tribal cultures, and now we've sort of been able to expand our notion of a tribe. Mm -hmm to be a nation state, right? Or, you know, you know, maybe a little bigger, you know, uh, the EU or, or something like this. But really, I think it is a, an unanswered question whether humanity will, for all of our science and everything that we've done, whether we will ultimately be able to survive mm -hmm. 
and overcome that tribalism. Um, because it is exactly what keeps us from taking action on global warming. You know, global warming, uh, yeah. laser mass would be like, here's the science, you know, we're going to release it to the public and we're going to do it, right? And and then it's like, oh, no, we still have this buried in our brains, right? That, hey, that doesn't well, that, seem that, that to comes, have a lot to do with my in, tribe. Within the first part of the film, like when you first meet Quatermass, like the whole thing, his whole argument that he is having with the, with the government and Breen is about this notion that rocket group is a government's project and he's it's all about discovery he's very gene roddenberry about it you know that we want to go out and we want to discover and we can have these things on the moon and on mars and hopefully it'll bring us all together because you know it expands us and breen's response is how naive you are because we want to be the first onto those places because they won't just be bases there'll be military bases because the person the first and it's, it's it's why trump's now got a space force um we want to be the first ones out there so we can ju we can police the earth with ballistic missiles and that's actually what they state in the film um and it's it's, it's there it's like well the british want to be the first there so we yes. can police the earth with ballistic missiles and you're just like my god like yeah they, so it's you know we shouldn't be allowed in space we're dangerous enough on earth let's not go out space and you know <laughs> infect and damage other other species um I, I, the one thing I find interesting about this film, though, is it's 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 so it's relatively small. It's localized, and that's for a number of reasons. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say it's an artistic re reason. It'd be budgetary reasons, you know. Like you can have three sets and this much cast. Like that's what you've got, um, and hopefully we can reuse the sets for another film next week. Um, but like that, that keeps this thing local. But I love this idea that sort of like it's kept in this small location within you know Hobbs End's uh, uh, tube station. You have a very sort of close knit cast. Um, but this, the implications of this are massive. I mean, this sort of you know, I mean, granted they sort of suggest that Mars five million years ago was habited by these insect creatures. We know that's sort of not not the case. Um, you know, we know, but that doesn't mean that the the galaxy, the universe, isn't populated. And that's why I sort of I love that this does tap into those Lovecraftian ideas of, you know, we start with this thing of, of, of this thing uh, starts with them unearthing human or humanoid remains, linking it to us. And as you said before, it's that onion sort of thing. It unpeels and unpeels. And then by the end of it, like I say you have this this thing of intergalactic uh, impact of creatures impact on us. And, and, but yet you are still focused in on this little part of London with this small cast, but you are talking about millions of years and intergalactic conspiracy. And I just love that, that it's, it feels incredibly Lovecraftian because that's what Lovecraft would have. It'd be sort of like, you know, one gentleman who swoons probably at some point is, but then unearths it's massive intergalactic conspiracy. Um, and I, I just really enjoy that. Yeah. I think you make it a good, good, point about the scope of it and how it manages to sort of balance those concerns. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we're mm -hmm. both sort of fans of small scope <laughs> stuff, um, you know, that, that have larger meaning. I mean, I think for me, uh, you know, for me, the, those themes of, um, you know, the, the evil within us, the potential within us of sort of science versus militarism and, mm. you know, mil there are no answers here. The sort of how, you know, I mean, yeah. obviously you and I are on the Ron and Barry side of things, but, you know, if you acknowledge that there is this evil clan-like thing in all of us, um, you know, making sure you got those missile bases might not be a bad idea, you know? Um you know, you probably don't want to say, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. we can rain hellfire down on yeah. you, Finland, <laughs> so do what we want. But, you know, you can still uh, um, have some national security. I mean, there's no real answer to there, that. I love that theme. I love the mix of the, the supernatural and science fiction. Um, I love how ambiguous sort of mm. ultimately the powers of the craft are. And I think that, you know, for my money, that last 20 minutes or so is just kind mm. of a tour de force. And if you are watching it for the first time, maybe you're an American and you're like, these guys have funny accents, <laughs> you know. Um, but you're watching it for the first time, you know, make it through the end. We'll get to 
you know, the sort of uh, devastation at the end, which I think is spectacular. Yeah, I'd agree. And I really incredibly agree. I mean, you know, I mean, um, this is was obviously my choice for the list and stuff. So you know, I'm ho- I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed it and sort of you know and um, you know, hopefully I don't, I don't know if you've had it. You you um, you you can find the other Hammer Quatermass films. Um, the one thing I'd say is if you want to find this, it's readily available. Like it's on several streaming services, I believe. Um, but also you can pick it up on Blu-ray and DVD. Um, Hammer Studios these days are happy to sort of blast stuff out. They've done a load of stuff. I've got a really wonderful 21 DVD box set of, of their sort of key films and stuff, which is really cool. Um, yeah, there's a couple of other films on there. Wow. I, I am tempted to sort of maybe see if we can squeeze in here at some point in the future. Um, but I, I would say that go, go check them out because Quatermass as a character um, is a is a creator's character. So he wasn't, you know, he's not written by anybody else. Throughout all of this, he was written by a guy called Nigel Neal who wrote the original British um uh series he then turned them into novels and then they got turned into films and so he was involved in all of it so it's very much a character that has been defined by a creator um and i would say the actors the actors involved have changed him over time and i would say that this interpretation is andrew Keir, uh, is probably the most well known um I'd also, I'd also remember that there was a 2005 i think 2005 2007 maybe um the bbc re- redid it uh, with Sky TV, and they did it live. And uh, Ian, not Ian Fleming, uh, Jason Fleming uh, played Quatermass, but it also starred like uh, David Tennant and uh, several other sort of known actors and stuff. So David Tennant just before he became Doctor Who, uh, ironically enough. So you know, again, that connection. Um, so, uh, well, yes. And what they did was the, the yeah. Quatermass experiment. They reshot that. And they did it live because the original one on the BBC yes. was shot yes. live. And if you watch the original <laughs> in those BBC, days. it's clearly evident it was shot live, uh, even when they trip over a piece of scenery that's not <laughs> supposed to move. <laughs> so, uh, as you said, polystyrene rocks and cardboard walls. Um, but I love it. There's a charm to this film, but there's also it's just it's just just a good sci-fi sort of like thriller horror film. Um, and I. I, I I'm sad that Quatermass seems to have been lost in the, in the, the annals of time, and I'd love him to come to you know to be reintroduced uh, to a modern audience. I mean, you know, it's, <clears throat> he would quite easily translate, I think, to to modern day um, in some way. Um, but I don't know what what are your thoughts? No, I agree with that. Uh, I I think it's fascinating. I mean, I had never heard of Quatermass, uh, um, and it's fascinating to me having, you know, lived in sci-fi for all this time that I hadn't. Um, and not only because of the Doctor Who connection and, you know, having read about early BBC, but uh, also, um, um, mm. I don't know, and also Hammer Films, right? I mean, oh, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, well, yeah. that was, that was the, one of those other things that they did. Um, but, uh, no, I agree. I agree. It's a very good film. I, I think that it deserves a lot more of attention than it gets. Um, I'm glad you said that about the other uh, Quatermass actors because I, I was aware mm. that he se- seemed to get recast a lot, right? <laughs> Without the excuse of regeneration. Um, but, you know, I agree with you that it, it deserves a wider attention. It's fascinating as from all of these perspectives as sort of um, having that creator control, which you don't think is going to be something of that time, a sort of mid-century sci-fi. Um, and I agree, it's ripe for like a, I would think like a, uh, you know, cable TV revival or something, you know, sort of <clears throat> like, you know, here's the X-Files, uh, you know, with, uh, we'll run through, uh, you know, the original plots and, you know, set up this, you uh, this thing it, it, you know i guess a, one question would be like do you do it in a retro futuristic way in the original setting because it is sort of you know uh rocket group and you know the aftermath of world war ii and the blitz i mean there are even there's even dialogue in here about like well <laughs> you were too young to have been in the war you know uh it clearly the world war i don't II know I, I honestly think you could update over. a lot of it uh, and what the way I see it is, you know, with people like Elon Musk trying to sort of send their own rockets up, or Richard Branson and all these other sort of this private enterprise trying to send rockets up, 
<clears throat> transport Quatermass from um, the government to the private industry. Like, you know, in, in, in trying to act as almost this scientific uh, uh, voice of conscience mm -hmm. against, you know, capitalism or, or, you know, industry. I think you could do it. Um, I mean, the, the plot for the first one is very much like they send up a rocket. Uh, they don't have permission, but they send up a rocket with three men in it. And when it comes back, it only has one. Only one of the guys comes back um, and the other two are killed. Um, and you sort of look, you begin to learn how they died and this other stuff. And the guy that survives um, starts to transform into some sort of like monster. Um, and eventually he escapes and he sort of they, they have to run him down and it's sort of I think you said he sort of he's captured in um, St. Uh, um, Paul's Cathedral in, in the original. Um, and there was several in the film version, in the, the Hammer film version, there's an absolutely sort of uh, heartbreaking scene when this guy's clearly been infected by whatever's in space. I mean, it's, it's pretty Fantastic Four as well, remember. Um, uh, this guy who comes back, he's been affected by something in mm -hmm. space, and his yeah. wife is there sort of saying to him, like, you know, you're going to come home and you're going to be fine. And he just looks at her and he's like, no, I'm not. And you're like, well, what, what do you know that nobody else does? And it's really creepy and really well done. Um, and so that, that one's really good, and I think you could easily replicate it. The second one is about genetically modified food. <laughs> Yeah, so Quatermass Two is they come really? across. Well, it sort of is. It's sort of they come across a um, a small town. Then the, the, you, they can't understand why there are people there because there doesn't seem to be any industry, uh, and it all because of these meteorites that have fallen. And then they find this massive refinery, and it turns out they keep saying to them, "Oh, we're doing we're doing food food produce here. You know, we're going to say we're going to help say, prevent starvation and, and you know famine and blah blah blah." And then it turns out that it's not. It's actually another sort of um, I can't remember if it's an alien invasion or a government control thing, but then basically the food mass that's in there, oh, it is an alien, definitely alien invasion, because the food mass that's in there turns into a giant monster and breaks out um, across the sort of Yorkshire moors. Um, it's great. It's really good. Um, and th th those original ones are all in black and white, but I, I <laughs> highly recommend them because they are wonderful. Um but yeah, you could do this again. They say there's so much more you could do with. Um, uh, there was another one redone in '79, I think it was. Um, which is, it's just called Quatermass, and it's an old man. Mm -hmm. Like if you think like Old Man Logan or Old Man like Marvel have done, it's Old Man Quatermass, and it's him trying to look for his granddaughter in this sort of like after everything's happened, Britain's gone to shit, and it's him sort of going across the landscape trying to find her and stuff. It's it's again, I've not seen all of it. I've seen I've seen this ones I need to get to watch all of it, but. They've done stuff with him, and I just—I'd love to revisit it. I really would. Is that last one sort of uh, post-apocalyptic? Because I, I know, like, he's retired. From yeah, it's sort of the, the uh, it's post-apocalyptic. He's traveling across. It's got again. It's sort of. Um, I don't know why it was happening in sort of the late seventies, early early eighties, but it's got that. It's that sort of post-nuclear. Something's happened. I can't remember what it was, but you've still got pockets of sort of like civilization. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thatcher, <laughs> probably, yeah, most probably. She, st <laughs> she stopped the children's milk, and it just went to pot after that. Um, but it, it's again, it's quite good, and it taps into that sort of like again, just that quintessential British Doctor Who esque, uh, you know, non-violent, but it's all about knowledge, and then they unco they uncover something at the end of it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I you know, I'd, I'd love more people to pay attention to Quater Mass, and and you know, uh, give him give it some attention and, and, and unearth it and, you know, find it again. Well, and I do think that, that, you know, that mm. it can seem old fashioned, but that sort of, uh, you know, God, you know, what we mm. need now is pro science, you know, what we need now is a little bit of that utopian, um, you know, no, I mean, e we're in an age where even recognizing facts <laughs> is controversial, right? Let alone a kind of, you know, Roddenberry-esque, um, you know, humanity can work together mm. and can achieve wonderful, great things, um, you know, which is a notion dear to my heart. Um, and I think that with all of the cynicism in science fiction today, and especially in the the um, proliferation of cable shows, mm -hmm. most of which are dark and dystopian in one way or another. 
um, having one that is a uh, return to that kind of bright utopian thing, which, you know, God knows we all yeah. need in these times right now anyway, uh, I think would, would work very well. Yeah, I think you're, again, so you're I, just I, I like about sort of like, you know, uh, post fact world. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can imagine him sort of talking with sort of Dr. Fauci, you know, and trying to sort of trying to just trying to get facts across. In fact, I could see, I could see <laughs> quite a mass working against, you know, a Boris Johnson or a Donald Trump in those ways of, of sort of, you know, the frustration of, um, you know, if this pandemic was an alien an alien virus <laughs> you know and him sort of saying like no 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 lock you've got to be locked mm -hmm. down you've got to wear masks you've got to do this like that you know and, and getting rather uh, frustrated about it all so um i do i agree in fact i think now is the time for quatermass to return yeah and i i think that the i was thinking like well if that if that were the case today I mean, Twitter yeah. mass would say, you can't still be on this nonsense about how it's going to disappear when it gets hot or something. You know, I mean, he'd be very outspoken. Obviously, you know, Fauci doesn't dare, dare do that. But that led in my mind to a, a bigger point about how, um, you know, these myths, whether they're myths of science or myths of we're going to get to the moon or get to Mars, um, or, you know, in my country, the myth of sort of, uh, you know, the good sacrificing uh, American manhood, you know, that uh, provides and wants to provide in a strong and good ways, or, uh, you know, the um, yeah. way Roni goes to his death, that kind of like stiff upper lip, you know, Britain comes first. These myths, whether they're national myths or myths of ourselves as humans and, and how humanity and science works, um, have all failed, failed us, right? Nobody says, uh, hey, you know, screw you. Uh, you know, you can't still be going on about that nonsense, right? Well, they, you know, they uh, just uh, collapse yeah. in the face of uh, withering power. Um, and, you know, we could use a little more uh, militarant <laughs> yeah. uh, no, science. Maybe, maybe you will. And, that, you know, it's... Um... You know, maybe we, we maybe this will be it. Maybe this is the spark that uh, that brings us back. You know, Quater Mass, and then you know, and he can lead and sort of inspire the next generation to actually pay attention to science. And we'll get rid of the flat earthers, and we'll get rid of the you know these other people that don't want to mm -hmm. believe that wearing a mask sort of forces you to smoke to breathe carbon dioxide. Bloody idiots! But yes, so only okay, to, to round it out, then I'm really glad you enjoyed this because I wasn't sure. Because I say it's, it's 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 a film I really enjoy, um, so I, I feel like we're two for two really in season in in this season. With um, you know, yeah. Godzilla was a good start. I think it was fascinating to sort of uh, a good way to start, and then we've gone to to Quatermass. So we've gone, um, you know, we've covered Toho, we've covered Hammer, uh, we've covered some heady topics in both of those. Really, you know, we've talked about all kinds of things, and so next week we're going to go really into some hard hitting sort of deep sort of thought process sci-fi uh with uh, with barbarella is, is what we're covering next <laughs> yes if you ever wanted to see a <laughs> uh utopian vision of science uh barbarella yes. is about to um deliver i can't wait it. i haven't seen this film in years um i think it's probably been about 15 20 years since i've seen this film um so i'm really looking forward to going back and visiting it and it's sort of um Campy wonderfulness, um, different, different cha change of pace. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, very much so. But I, but I think uh, all of these films have been, uh, you know, we selected them because we they're sort of cult classics or because we love them. Um, and you know, uh, Quite a Mass in, in the mm. Pit took me took me longer to get into. But once I got into it, uh, you know, increasingly it was that onion peel. It was increasingly mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm liking this more and more. Every 15 minutes, I'm liking more than the last 15 minutes. And uh, <laughs> and by the end, I thought, I'm going to watch this again. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, and I and I had never seen for all of the Godzilla movies I'd seen and remakes and everything. And, you know, I'd never seen the original Godzilla. So it's it's been a real fun trip. And I think that... Yeah. Uh, you know, I love Barbarella. Uh, I think you probably saw it 
earlier than I did for the first time. Um, but uh, I think uh, Barbarella is a great movie and in his own sense <laughs> is a beacon uh, in a very different way. Cool. I can't wait. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah, it, even um, it, it's really, it sat on the side ready to sort of get in a few out. And, and um, uh, Alex, my wife, saw it and she's like, Is that got Jane Fonda in? And I was like, Yeah, yeah. And she's like, Oh, I really like Jane Fonda. Can I watch it? I was like, Yeah, of course you can. Jump in. So it'll be an interesting experience to see what she thinks of it as well. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely let you know. But yeah, but. I, Yes, it is. Well, that that will be fascinating yeah. because we're two yeah, white guys. It wasn't obvious. <laughs> if you, have, if you don't know, <laughs> two sort of white guys offering their opinion on uh, a sixties, yeah, a 60s British film and a fifties Japanese film so far. Uh, so yeah, it'd be interesting, especially for Barbara uh, to get uh, Alex's opinion. It'd be interesting. Uh, but another another crack up stuff. Really enjoyed talking about um, Quatermass, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the season. So, Julian, thank you very much again, uh, and. Uh, we shall crack on in next episode. Thank you very much, guys. Always my pleasure. Stop. Yes.